This is Julianne Condia, host of Rewritten. Thank you so much for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Hey, it's Baxter Colburn here from Public House Media. Did you know that we just added a store here at Public House Media? No, I'm not talking about a grocery store where you can go buy apples or bananas or peanut butter, which are all fantastic, especially when peanut butter's on all of those. Anyway, we've added a store here at Public House Media so you can not only come and represent your favorite podcast network, but also represent your favorite shows as well, too. Just go over to thephmedia.com. And look in the top right corner where you'll see the, the button that says store. Click on that and you can search through all of our great products. Or if you go to our Facebook page, Public House Media, you can see on the left-hand side a tab that says store. All of our products are listed there as well, too. It's the new Public House Media store. You don't want to miss it. It is fantastic. Buy some of that great swag to support your favorite shows and to support Public House Media. Check it out today. Hi, this is Baxter Colburn, host of the Verse of the Day podcast here on Public House Media. Once you're done with this episode, I hope you'll come check out my show, Verse of the Day, where we take a look at real-world experiences and applications to one Bible verse every Monday through Friday as we get an idea of what it looks like to be a little bit better of a Christian and how we can make this world a better place one verse at a time. I hope you'll join me every single Monday through Friday right here on Public House Media. I hope you'll subscribe by going to Apple Podcasts or wherever you find good podcasts as well. Once again, thanks for tuning in to the following broadcast here on Public House Media. The latest headlines. The Houston Astros, the defending World Series champions, got better, adding Garrett Cole. The insightful interviews. Rick Saratella, NFL Draft Bible. With how much emphasis is put on the position, yet how many over the last couple of years we've had questions, why do we put such an emphasis on drafting a quarterback number one overall? The bottom line is there's not enough good quarterbacks to go around. And I think with the new CBA, it's really a low-risk gamble now. If you look at the playoff teams, the common denominator good quarterback play the hottest takes i think the guy to blame is the one guy who hasn't left yet i think russell westbrook is one of the bigger problems in oklahoma city can all be found on press row broadcasting is part of the public house media network here's your host it doesn't matter what your name is christian heimel Welcome on Press Row, everybody, once again here on this Wednesday, June 6, 2018, coming to you a day earlier than we normally do. Got some scheduling conflicts here this week um, in the personal and professional world, so we're just going to give you guys what we normally do just a day early. So we hope that uh, you guys have continued to support the show as you always have by subscribing, rating, reviewing, sharing us with your friends and family. You can do that on Apple Podcasts, Google Play iHeartRadio, Spreaker.com, Stitcher.com. Of course, you can also check us out on iHeartRadio and uh, thephmedia.com, which uh, you can also get some awesome Press Row gear hanging out here right now in our Press Row Raglan t-shirt with our Press Row coffee mug and in, enjoying life here as we always are each week here on the Public House Media Network. Don't forget to find us on Facebook, Press Row by Public House Media. You can also Find us on Twitter and Instagram at PressRowPHM or email the show, PressRowPHM at gmail.com. A lot of news to get to here uh, this week. Of course, the passing of Dwight Clark, the San Francisco 49ers legend uh, at age 61 after his battle with ALS. We'll touch on that in the last segment of the show along with your listener questions as well. LeBron James and the Cleveland Cavaliers, Game 3 tonight uh, at home. What can they do to stave off what would be in insurmountable, it feels already insurmountable already at 2-0, doesn't it? It feels like this is going to be a sweep, um, but I, I don't think it's going to happen. I've said consistently that the Cavs will at least win one game at home. Uh, I don't think LeBron will allow that to happen. And then uh, the Washington Capitals uh, are putting a buzzsaw to the best story in sports in the Vegas Golden Knights. Now one win away from the Stanley Cup championship, which uh, would be their first in their 44-year history that game four coming, excuse me, game five in Vegas coming up tomorrow night uh, on Thursday night. Uh, Major League Baseball as well. Some other news and notes throughout the world. Um, but I, I want to start with what's kind of been an unfortunate narrative in, in the world. I mean, it's unfortunate when a sport that's in the off season 
where you're not actually playing games is still being discussed for negative reasons. It's it's one thing when, you know, last summer the NBA, it seemed like dominated the summer in the offseason because of Lonzo Ball in the G League, the Kyrie Irving trade, the Gordon Hayward signing, Paul George trade, um, Carmelo Anthony to the Thunder, Phil Jackson, all that stuff. It, it Stuff that actually mattered to the game. Uh, that was fine. But when the NFL continues to be in this public eye and continues to be in the spotlight for negative things, this, this anthem policy, the demonstrations that are happening, it continues to shine a very poor light on what has consistently been over the last probably two decades the most popular sport in our country. And it's continued to be that way this week after the president um, decided to disinvite the Philadelphia Eagles, the Super Bowl champions, to the White House for what has always been a customary celebration. Um, now, listen, where I have my issues, I, I, I could care less. I, I don't. It doesn't matter to me. whoop de freaking do You get to go to the White House. The White House, by the way, is open for tours if you really want to go. It, it's, it's pretty easy to get onto a tour. You just got to book a reservation and then go to D.C. Um, my parents have done it probably six times in the last three years. It's pretty easy to do if you really want to. So visiting the White House is not a big deal, Uh, especially when you're not actually meeting and sitting down with the president and discussing certain things. It's a really kind of boring thing. That's one of the biggest parts about this um, that I think we need to say up front. The Eagles visiting the White House, much as it has been with any champion, um, you know, Super Bowl, World Series, um, NBA, NHL, college basketball, whatever it is. Anybody who gets to go for this, you don't get to sit down and hang out with the president and talk policy. You don't get to bring up what's on your mind. They don't ask you for your opinion on certain things. It's a photo op. It's a quick little, um, you know, hey, how are you? And that's it. So let's say that up front right now. The thing that bothers me is that we have had some really unfortunate and poor uh, reporting by members of the media in a whole bunch uh, uh, of this this week. Um, first off, you had Fox News. This this is just bad. So here, here's how it all happens in case you've been living under a rock or don't know what's happening. Um, President Trump said this uh, on Monday, um, tweeted this out, uh, sent out an announcement, excuse me. The Philadelphia Eagles are unable to come to the White House with their full team to be celebrated tomorrow, being Tuesday. They disagree with their president because he insists that they proudly stand for the national anthem, hand on heart, in honor of the great men and women of our military and the people of our country. The Eagles wanted to send a smaller delegation, but the 1,000 fans planning to attend the event deserve better. First and foremost, um, the smaller delegation wasn't because of anything President Trump said. The Philadelphia Eagles, zero Philadelphia Eagles knelt during the past season. Every single one of them stood for the national anthem throughout the entire season, all the way up until they won the Super Bowl. Uh, Some of them, yes, raised their fists. Some of them um, may have demonstrated in some other way. But absolutely none of them... um, did not stand, as President Trump supposedly believes. Uh, That's the first issue that I have with this. Um, Number two is, like I said, it's a photo op. It's not an opportunity to sit and discuss policy, to sit and try to make change that these players are hoping for, um, anyone who made a demonstration, you know, hoped for. Um, I understand what a lot of people... um, you know the, the the small number he uh, as President Trump tweeted only a small number of players decided to come and we canceled the event. It, it, that's petty in my opinion. It's very petty in general. It's it's like being a child. It really is. It, you know you you don't want to come to my birthday party. Fine, you're not invited anyway. Um, and this isn't the first time it's happened. Did the same thing with the Golden State Warriors last year when Steph Curry said at a media day that. They weren't sure if they were going to attend or not. So what did he do? He rescinded the entire invitation. Um, So I find it phenomenal, number one, how many of the the players have come out and said exactly what was happening. Um, 
Tory Smith tweeted out, uh, quoting the statement from the president. Um, not many people were going to go. No one refused to go simply because Trump, quote, insists folks stand for the anthem. Three, the president continues to spread the false narrative that players are anti-military. That's the biggest issue that I've had with all of this. Like I've told you before, we got to stop looking at what they're doing and start looking at why they're doing it. None of this was anti-flag, anti-America, anti-military. I understand what Colin Kaepernick said when he originally started this. I understand that in 2016, in August 2016, he actually said, these were his exact words, I'm not going to stand up to show pride in a flag for a country that oppresses black people and people of color. I understand that. That's not a good look for the whole start of this. But when it starts getting turned around by politicians, by legislatures, by anybody who is unwilling to accept the truth behind the demonstration and are willing to manipulate it for their own good to demonize these players and to actually prove these players correct that there is that type of social and racial injustice, that's where I have an issue. This These demonstrations have never been about the military. Never. Um, so it's incredible. It's incredible to that. Um, so many of them said that uh, they weren't going to attend because they didn't want to. They didn't want to, for the photo op. They didn't want that. Um, you know, and, and the fact that you had players like Malcolm Jenkins who went out and said, you know, what he said. I mean, you got to remember this about some of these Eagles players. This Eagles organization is one of the most socially uh, conscious organizations. There was Chris Long donated every single bit of his salary last year to charity to help with education. Every single cent of it went to that. Incredible. Unbelievable. Nobody talks about that. The Eagles, as a team, they go to homeless shelters. They go to uh, hospitals. They do all this charity work, and nobody talks about it. Now, a lot of that, I think, personally, is on the Eagles, uh, whether as an organization or as players, to not go out and make sure that's on video, make sure that people are covering it. There's, you know, that that's a, another issue in and of itself. But it it's embarrassing that this whole thing, from the NFL anthem policy to President Trump tweeting and saying what he did earlier this week, to people having to ask LeBron James his thoughts, and LeBron saying, I can tell you nobody wants that invite no matter who wins this, talking about the NBA championship, it won't be Cleveland or Golden State going, it's embarrassing because this is an issue that would have been gone. I really do believe that. I really firmly believe it. If nobody said anything, this would have gone away. It would have gone away. They were going to stop showing the anthem on TV. People were going to get bored of the social media narrative and the keyboard warriors. It would have gone away. But for whatever reason, the NFL, Roger Goodell, the owners are scared little children of a big bad president who made one comment nine months ago. You got to get over it, people. You got to either, one, under, first thing you need to do is understand why they're doing it and, and accept the fact that they're doing it for a reason, a legitimate reason. This isn't made up. This isn't some Napoleon complex that these players have. It's real. It's a true problem. The second issue is either get over it or help. That's the biggest problem with all of this is that we don't have anybody willing to do the first step to get to the second step. Nobody's willing to accept the truth to be able to either move past it or help fix it. That's the problem. And, and, and honestly, the biggest issue was within the media. Folks like myself, folks like anybody else who have a microphone or have a social media platform, stop talking about the negative crap. The Philadelphia Eagles organization is just as much to blame about this. You have social media people. You have website developers, content developers on your staff. Take an iPhone, head out with these players when they go to do these charitable events, videotape it, put it on social media, send it to the local news, and get a story about it. So you don't have stories about this. That's where the biggest issue is. 
It's not fake news. It's not alternative news. It's no news. There's no news about it. Make some news about it. That's where we have one of the biggest issues with all of this. We want to focus on what they're doing, not why they're doing it, not how they're fixing it, not if they're fixing it. Because that was one of the reasons why I couldn't stand Colin Kaepernick at the start of it. What was he doing to fix it? And then it turns out, after I did my own research, he was doing a lot. And that's why I get it. That's why I'm with him. That's why I'm with these players. I get it. I understand. But you know what? Unless there's footage, nobody cares anymore. Picks or it didn't happen, right? Come on. We're better than this. And, and, and when the NFL, with how much money it makes, and how many people's eyeballs immediately go to it, you know the first thought most football fans have the Monday after the Super Bowl? When's OTAs? When's the draft? When's the schedule come out? Football is always on our mind. And unfortunately, so far this spring and summer, it's been for a really, really poor reason. It starts with the people covering it. It starts with the players who are a part of it. Change the narrative instead of having to keep coming after and responding. Don't be reactionary. Don't do it. It makes you look stupid and childish. You know, it's really funny. My father always said this to me. Don't ever argue with stupid people. They will drag you down to their level and beat you with experience. Don't do that. Don't. We'll get into actual sports when we return. NBA Finals Game 3 tonight. What do the Cleveland Cavaliers have to do to get past what has been an onslaught of the Golden State Warriors? Uh, What the new video shows about LeBron's future in Cleveland? Stanley Cup Finals, Capitals one win away from that first Stanley Cup in franchise history. Major League Baseball, your questions as well. It's all coming up in just a little bit. You're on Press Row, broadcasting as part of the Public House Media Network. I'm the Greg. And I am Dave Show. We host the Greg and Dave Show on Public House Media. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Once you're done with this episode, I hope you'll come check out our show, The Greg and Dave Show, where we talk about strange, bizarre, and sometimes just downright quirky news stories that you may not have heard about. A new show comes out every Wednesday. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes. And hey, thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. This is Daniel Poppy, host of How to Write Good here on Public House Media. I just want to thank you for listening to the following broadcast brought to you by Public House Media. Once you're done with this episode, I hope that you'll come check out my show, How to Write Good, the writing show that is not about writing. A new show of How to Write Good comes up every Wednesday, so don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you never miss an episode of How to Write Good. Again, thanks for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. Welcome back on Press Row, everybody. It's pretty much how the Cavaliers have felt these last two games in the NBA Finals, especially after Steph Curry had as many three-pointers himself as the Cavaliers had as an entire team in Game 2. And you kind of felt this was how it was going to go, right? You felt like if LeBron and company couldn't win Game 1, they weren't going to win anything, right? It was kind of how it felt, and, and that's kind of how this continues to look. Uh... Over the course of these NBA Finals, Game 3, of course, tonight in Cleveland. Um, I have said consistently, I think this is where they get at least one. Um, I I think LeBron, for whatever reason, finds a way to get a win here. Um, But it's going to take a monument. It's going to take a Herculean. It's going to take a LeBron James effort to really do this. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable how much LeBron means to this team. It's... What he did in Game 1, 51 points, 8 rebounds, 8 assists, you still lose. And then in Game 2, he's getting ripped for whatever reason because he had 29 points, uh, 13 assists, and I think 9 rebounds. Yeah. Guy was a rebound shy of a triple-double. Couldn't do anything. Took 20 shots. His teammates were atrocious. Kevin Love, 22-10, and 10, about the only one who actually mattered. 
George Hill, 5 of 12. J.R. Smith was, well, J.R. Smith, terrible as usual. There's nothing you could do against that Golden State team. Especially when Duran is going off for 9 rebounds, 7 assists, 26 points. Clay Thompson, 20 points. JaVale McGee has 12. Draymond Green had 5 points, 7 assists, and 8 rebounds. That's unnecessary. How good this team is. And they're going to get Andre Iguodala back, by the way. They're going to get Iguodala back tonight. Whether he actually plays or not, who knows, but he's going to be there. And he might actually play. And that's just even more dangerous. It's another weapon for this Golden State team. What they're doing is just not fair. How talented this team is. Um, It's one of the insane things to think of. That LeBron is legitimately, with this ragtag group of guys, going up against four Hall of Famers, potentially. Steph Curry, Kevin Durant, Klay Thompson, Draymond Green. It's insane to think that. It's, oh my goodness. What... What's impressive is how Golden State is doing it defensively, too. I know offensively they're incredible, and they're a lot of fun to watch, and there's nothing better in basketball, in my opinion, than when Golden State has it working offensively. When they're distributing the basketball like they have been, when they're going around for 28 assists, 57% from the floor, 42% from three, when they miss eight free throws and still win by 19, there's nothing better than this Golden State team when they're working together. But defensively what is, is what's impressive. If you watch them and what they've done, they're especially everything on switches, on pick and rolls, on all this stuff, any screen, they're switching everything off the ball. Everything. Which doesn't have Kevin Durant chasing LeBron all over the place. It, it, it's, it's okay. Kevin can just kind of, you know, he, they switch off. Kevin Durant can save his energy and become the dominant scorer that he is. On the ball, switches. Anything except Steph Curry, Kevin Love. Curry stays on Love there. Just watch it. I'm I'm serious. Watch it. Watch these games and watch Steph Curry stay on Kevin Love the entire time if if that that on-ball switch comes. Because then, Love's got to try to figure out how to get it out of Curry's hands. And and it's just unbelievable to, to watch. It's insane. I mean, when you, when you saw that, it, that three-point shot that, that Curry hit over Love, it's unbelievable. That's what they wanted. That's what they were hoping for. And they get it. And they execute perfectly. It's unbelievable to see what this team does. It's amazing to watch. And, and, and that's what I don't understand. You know, I, I understand a lot of people are upset, oh, the predictability of the NBA. You're the same people who are really happy that, you know, these... Marvel comic book movies follow the exact storylines of the comic books. This is how you wanted it to be, remember? If you want the best teams playing, don't be upset when the best teams are actually playing. I understand that Gordon Hayward and and Kyrie Irving got hurt and the Celtics aren't in it, and you're upset about that. I understand that you're tired of watching Golden State, but these are the best teams. It's the best team probably in NBA history against the best player, arguably, in NBA history. This is what we wanted. This is what we hoped for, and you're mad about it. I don't understand. So it's 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 one of those things that just really boggles my mind to see how many people are upset about this NBA Finals instead of just enjoying it. Because, again, I understand. Listen, nobody can't stand Draymond Green more than me. Maybe Charles Barkley, but nobody, nobody is ready to turn off the TV as soon as Draymond Green starts his little stupid antics. I don't care about Steph Curry's shimmy because you know what? The guy's earned it. I don't care about LeBron James' chest pump and all his crap because he's earned it. The dude's the best player on the planet. It's not even close. Not even close. Kevin Durant's getting, you know, 33 and 10 because he plays with, or he's getting 22 and 10 because Steph Curry's putting up 33 because Klay Thompson's putting up 20 because Draymond Green is busy clogging up the lane. Like, there's, that's why. You know, that's a true team. Randy Moss had 51 touchdown catches because Tom Brady threw him 51 passes in the end zone. Like, that's that's how good this team is. And yet we're sitting here watching LeBron do the most ridiculous things in the world. And I understand that he put this team together. I get that. Look, it's <laughs> I jokingly tweeted the other day, it's a shame that LeBron the GM is ruining LeBron the player's claim at greatest of all time. 
Because otherwise, I, I truly believe that if if this Cleveland team wasn't put together the way LeBron wanted with Kyle Korver and Tristan Thompson and J.R. Smith having max contracts and they had actual talent on the floor, there'd be no question as to who the greatest of all time is, even before he's done playing. But we're here. We're at that point. And that's what's unfortunate, is that we're not able to enjoy it. And I've said that to you guys many a time. So what does that mean for tonight? I, I don't I don't know. I can't tell you. Because here's what I do know. Cleveland at home is a much better team. Any team at home is a much better team. There's something about it from Little League all the way up to the pros. You sleep in your own bed. You have your own routine. You don't have to get on the bus to, from the hotel. You're not worried about distractions in a different city. You know, you, you, whatever it is. Every team plays better at home. There's something about LeBron, though, in this postseason that we've questioned more than anything else, and that's his competitiveness, his pride. And time and time again, he's proven us wrong. Now, do I think he's coming back from 2-0? Absolutely not. This series is over. Golden State's the champions. Absolutely. Done. Done deal. But there's something about LeBron's passion that has been challenged this postseason, whether it was by a young kid in Oladipo in round one, whether it was by a ghost named Jordan in round two, whether it was the Celtics and their young core in game three, or in round three. Here, it's this idea that if he loses a sixth finals, when he loses a sixth finals, there is never any opportunity for him to be considered one of the greats, or the greatest, I should say. He's going to show you why. It doesn't matter. Because you got to remember, Jerry West lost eight straight NBA Finals before finally winning one, and he's still considered Mr. Clutch. It's one of his nicknames, Mr. Clutch. Guy lost eight straight NBA Finals. Not very clutch, but that's how we know him. He's the logo. And there's something about his pride tonight that's going to go off. It's going to be impressive to watch. And I hope that when he does that his teammates somehow figured out. I think Kevin Love is starting to somehow, some way, years after his contract, he's starting to understand what his role is with this team. Defensively, he's still a liability, but he's getting better. Tristan Thompson is not enough to match up with Draymond Green. Kevin Love is not enough to match up with Klay Thompson. J.R. Smith cannot shut down uh, Steph Curry. LeBron could handle Durant, but the problem is, is if he goes too hard on these guys, he's going to foul out in the fir- in the second quarter. So, I think LeBron finds a way to have a monster game, 40-plus and a triple-double probably, to win Game 3. I think they lose Game 4, and I think they get absolutely have the doors blown off them, excuse me, in Game 5 in Golden State, and lose. And And I don't know what it means for his future. I don't. It's amazing, though, and I don't know if you saw this, but the story that came out, about Kevin Durant and how prior to that meeting in the Hamptons with Golden State, they started, I guess, planting the seeds or reaching out trying to get him to Golden State. It's a little impressive to see that. Um, you know, you find out that LeBron going to Miami, that was really in 2008 with the Olympics. That kind of decision was made, playing with Dwayne Wade on the Olympic team. Um... I really and, and now you're seeing the story about Chris Paul already trying to recruit and sending texts to LeBron during the season um, to possibly go to Houston. I don't know what this all means for the future of LeBron or the NBA, but what I do know is, like I said, LeBron the GM has royally screwed over LeBron the player. This team is not built to win championships. In the, in the Eastern Conference, without Gordon Hayward, without Kyrie Irving, yes. Because the East is garbage and has been for years. The East has not been competitive since Reggie Miller and John Starks. It just hasn't. I understand. It took LeBron teaming up with Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh for the East to win championships. I know that Paul Pierce, Kevin Garnett, Ray Allen squad was very talented. But that was an old Kobe that they beat. So the East has been garbage for 20 years, folks. And... It's, I'm not saying it's anything to shake a stick at, 
in LeBron or turn your nose up on that LeBron has been to eight straight finals, but it's uh it's not exactly the toughest road to hoe in the Eastern Conference. So we'll see what happens. I know there's plenty more to talk about. I'm I'm really I'm hopeful the Cavs win tonight. I am. I'm hopeful they win the next two. I'd love to see it go back to Golden State tied two two. I really would. Because who knows? Who knows what happens there? Maybe LeBron finds a way to put it together. Maybe J.R. Smith has a redemption moment after game one. Maybe Kyle Korver hits a couple big shots. Tristan Thompson plays great defense. Kevin Love has a really solid all-around game. Who knows? But there's going to be a lot of problems if this team can't figure it out defensively. Because Golden State has. Golden State has figured it out defensively how to shut down this team. And it's incredible to watch. They are a lot of fun to see. When we come back, we'll touch on the NHL Stanley Cup playoffs. Washington Capitals one win away. Is there anything the best story in sports can do to keep it going? Plus, we'll get on some NFL notes, Major League Baseball as well. Your listener questions, it's all coming up. In just a little bit, don't forget to subscribe, rate, review, share with your friends and family, Google Podcasts, Apple, uh, excuse me, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spreaker.com, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher.com, and of course, DPHmedia.com, where you can get some awesome Press Row gear. You can also find us on Facebook, Press Row by Public House Media, Twitter and Instagram, at Press Row PHM, email the show, Press Row PHM, at gmail.com. I'm Christian Heimel. You're on Press Row Broadcasting as part of the Public House Media Network. This is Sam Kirby, host of Cinema Stories here on Public House Media. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Once you're done with this episode, I hope you'll come check out my show, Cinema Stories, where we hang out and just talk movie and TV news and reviews, and it's awesome. A new show comes out every single Tuesday. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you never miss an episode of Cinema Stories. Thanks again for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. This is Ryan Pierce, host of Completely Serious, here on Public House Media. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Once you're done with this episode, I hope you'll come check out my show, Completely Serious, where we talk about sports and have fun with great guests. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you'll never miss an episode of Completely Serious. Thanks again for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. Oh, it's one of the best intro themes of all time. Back when the NHL used to be on ESPN, times were good. We didn't have social media, didn't have, you know, all this crap about the national anthem and whatnot, didn't have to worry about enjoying LeBron James and his ability on the court. All that fun stuff was no longer, it wasn't there back when this was still a thing, NHL and ESPN. Christian Alma here with you guys on Press Row, broadcasting as part of the Public House Media Network. Happy to have you along with us, how, wherever and however you're listening, whether it's on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spreaker.com, Stitcher.com, maybe TuneIn Radio, or maybe even on thephmedia.com while you're shopping for some awesome Press Row gear. Get yourself a hat, a T-shirt, a sweatshirt, coffee mug, phone case, socks, whatever it may be. We appreciate you guys doing it here on... Uh, public house media it's been a lot of fun here and uh, we'll get to your guys listener questions in a little bit as always you can submit those throughout the week on social media twitter and instagram at press row phm find us on facebook as well uh that is of course uh press row by public house media you can find me on twitter if you want at chris heimel c-h-r-i-s-h-e-i-m-a-l-l or you can email the show press row phm at gmail.com Stanley Cup playoffs, Game 5 tomorrow night in Vegas. The Golden Knights trailing 3-1, to one, one of the best stories in sports. And uh, their head coach doesn't seem to be too concerned. I like Gerard Gallant's message saying uh, the pressure's off us now. Uh, said that on Tuesday we're going to go out, play, and work hard to go have some fun, see what happens. It, it's kind of the only way you can really do when you're this far down, isn't it? You know, when you just have this kind of struggle. Uh, you're down 3-1. No team has ever come back down from 3-1. 
except for 1942 when the Toronto Maple Leafs were 3-0. Um, since in the best of seven format, teams trailing the final 3-1 to one have lost 32 out of 33 times except for that 42 Maple Leafs squad. So um, a, a team that has really kind of dominated in the postseason uh, went 12-3 and heading into the Stanley Cup Finals. Furthest they went was Game 6 against San Jose uh, after sweeping L.A. and then winning 4-1 over Winnipeg. Um, hasn't exactly been uh, easy for them here in the Finals. And give a lot of credit to Washington. I mean, they're incredible forecheck, though, how fast they've played. Braden Holpe has been absolutely incredible. Devontae smith Pelly has come up big uh, in a couple of these games. Alexander Kuznetsov, um, Alexander Ovechkin have been great. Uh, but you look at game four, James Neal missing an open net four minutes in, a uh, couple of posts in the first 10 minutes for this team. Um, and it seemed as though what could have been, what was a, a, a embarrassing loss in game four could have been a, a big win for them to come back. I mean, I still go back to game two and the save that Braden Holtby made to keep that game where it was which is absolutely impressive, uh, and that's really given these caps, this Caps team a lot of life. And, and you kind of almost wonder a little bit. Team in, in its first year, an expansion team, these aren't all rookies. These aren't guys who haven't played before, but they're all playing together for the first time. You almost kind of wonder if the mental toll is kind of taken, is getting there now. You know, you, you almost kind of wonder if they don't have the mental or the physical ability to continue with it. Um here for Vegas, even though they've been such a tremendous story. They've been so much fun. Um, but, uh, I mean, Evgeny Kuznetsov has been so talented um, for this team, uh, just scoring at will, it seems like. Like I said, Holpe has been even more impressive. Um, when you look at the regular season uh, between these two teams, you know, Vegas had every single advantage except for the power play and the faceoff. I mean, the faceoff was basically 50-50, but it seemed as though Vegas was a better team coming in. The more, um, I don't want to say motivated, maybe maybe had better momentum uh, behind them, but they've come in and just been incredibly talented. And it hasn't really been talked much, and I'm not a huge hockey guy. I'm really not. Um, but I wonder, the the way that the Capitals have kind of shut down Jonathan Mars' show, um, who was all being talked about so much here in these playoffs. He's been incredibly quiet his last six playoff games. Uh, you go back to game four against Winnipeg when he had an assist in that game, um, a game that I believe they lost, if I remember correctly. Um, but since then, in these, Stanley, these four games in the Stanley Cup Finals and that game five against Winnipeg, or excuse me, game... Yes, game five against Winnipeg. He's had two points, just two assists. Hasn't played great. Uh, when prior to that, in the Winnipeg series, prior to game five against Winnipeg, um, he's had just two points in the last five games. Prior to that, he had, let's see here, he had eight points in his previous five games, ten points in his previous six he has not been the same Jonathan Marsa show. I don't know what it is. I don't know if that's um, because what the Capitals have done. His shifts have consistently kind of gone down over the last couple of games. Uh, his time on the ice outside of Game 2 where he played nearly 21 minutes has gone down um, a little bit. He did play 19 minutes in Game 4, so you know, up from the 17 he played in Game 3. But it almost seems as though the Capitals have put a full-on kibosh on... Jonathan Marsha show the guy who was one of the big players for this Vegas team in the playoffs and kind of said, you know what, we're going to make sure somebody else beats us. And so far, nobody has. Um, and that's a smart job you know, by Barry Trotz. Great job by the Capitals for checking unit, their defensive unit. Um, they've done a very good job here. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I know I said Vegas in six, um, but I, I do think... Um, it might end up going the other way. I think Vegas gets one at home again just because you play so much better at home. They'll be rejuvenated. They'll be, um, you know, maybe have a little bit more confidence after a couple of days off, a chance to kind of sit, clear their minds, and, and a little bounce back uh, tomorrow night in Game 5 in Vegas. So that should be a fun one as well. You're on Press Row here, part of the Public House Media Network. Chris and I'm with you, uh, as always, 
Don't forget to subscribe, rate, review. Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spreaker.com, Stitcher.com, of course, TuneIn Radio, and ThePHMedia.com. Want to get to some NFL news and notes, uh, and then uh, we'll touch on your guys' listener questions coming up uh, in the last segment. Uh, interesting news out of Cleveland. It's it's kind of, um, <laughs> I don't know if this is a good thing. Um, Hugh Jackson says that Baker Mayfield is um, playing well, saying that he's right on schedule. Baker Mayfield, though, doesn't necessarily agree. As offseason practices hit week three, um, <laughs> Jackson saying uh, Tuesday, I think he's right on schedule. Baker saying the pace has been a little bit slower than I really wanted. Um, Mayfield says that despite working with a second team, um, uh, just said, said all that despite working with a second team, uh, they've both downplayed the situation saying Mayfield is just looking to work with some different teammates um, instead of giving him some first team action with Tyrod Taylor, probably the starter, at least you would think. I mean, I know, listen, I know the Browns spent their number one pick on Baker Mayfield and I applauded them for it. And I still firmly believe that uh, it was the right move for them. But Tyrod Taylor is the proven commodity right now. So for him to be the number one uh, starter right out of the gate isn't exactly a bad thing. Um, so I, I, I couldn't say that that's you know, an issue. Um, I do find it interesting, though, that uh, both the head coach and the quarterback have differing views on what progress is. Of course, a rookie quarterback who's a Heisman Trophy winner, who's the number one overall pick, is going to want to move a lot faster in his progression than his coach is going to want him to. And this is where I think Hugh Jackson is starting to learn some things. It's kind of smart, I think, to hold him back a little bit, whether it's by design or not. But you do not want another. Being the quarterback, being the number one overall pick for the Cleveland Browns has not worked out very well at all. So for Hugh Jackson, if he is by design holding Mayfield back a little bit and letting him slowly progress and get there, that's a smart move. I understand Mayfield wants to be... Baker Mayfield, he wants to be the number one draft pick, but you're going to have a plenty of time to do that. I wouldn't worry about it if uh, I was Baker Mayfield. And uh, I, I would just enjoy where you're at right now. Um, it, it's really kind of important to just sit and look. I, I thought what Hugh Jackson said was great. Saying the game's not too big for Mayfield. Um, he's got the ability to throw the ball, make decisions. Um, he's on schedule. Is he a finished product? No, but he's not supposed to be. And that's absolutely correct. Um, Mayfield, though, again, wants to be playing as soon as he possibly can. Says there's always a learning curve. There's a bump in the road. Um, when you learn a new offense, you're going up against the best competition possible. There's going to be a curve. So I hope he understands that, uh, saying you're not going to complete the whole puzzle at once. But he wants to keep getting better. And I think that's what's really important, too. Wants to keep getting better. Wants to keep learning. Um I have to be saying he has to be ready for whatever opportunity comes this year, next year, or five years. I know he wants to get better, but I think the best possible thing for the Cleveland Browns is for Baker Mayfield to maybe not be the starter week one, for him to continuously slowly progress. Because we saw this, and, and this is where I will allow the Johnny Manziel comparisons. On the field, they were somewhat similar. They were pretty close, but... Baker is, I think, a little bit smarter in terms of his progressions. He's a better student of the game than Johnny Manziel ever was. And I think Baker needs to allow himself to be that student of the game uh, and continue to learn, continue to grow, and continue to be what eventually could be one of, if not the more exciting number one picks that we've seen out of the, uh, out, out of the, the Cleveland Cavaliers over the last couple of years. So... Good on him, um, you know, and, and another quick story here. Good on Dalvin Cook, uh, by the way, before we head to break. Uh, as he joins the Minnesota Vikings um, in drills this week um, after that torn ACL in week four last year. First time in eight months he was able to participate during team drills uh, during OTAs here this past Monday. Um, was able to be cleared and went through a certain bit, very limited in the 11-on-11 drills, um, but great to see that. And this is, again, what makes Minnesota so interesting to me. I The Kirk Cousins deal, I get it. The, you know, They were a, a win away from the Super Bowl. Dalvin Cook could have played a huge part in that. You look at their first three weeks with him, he was one of the NFL leaders in rushing yards. Very talented back, can catch the ball, can block as well. Adding him makes Minnesota so much more 
exciting, so much more interesting, and I'm really, really, really pumped to see how it all happens. So happy to see that Dalvin Cook is back on the field, back that he's able to continuously get better. Um, You hope that he's able to be 100% come opening day uh, here in a couple months, Um, but he was there on the field taking reps with the first-team offense with a brace on his left knee. And, uh, and and we'll see what happens. All he was saying is that it's just another milestone. Um, and, uh, you know, his head coach understands that as well. It's not about him, you know, getting around bodies like crazy. It's about him trying to figure out what he can do. So really important, really good on Dalvin Cook. Happy to see that. Really excited that he's, uh, he's back because he's a lot of fun to watch. And he makes that Minnesota team that much more interesting to watch. When we return, just one segment left to go. We'll get to your listener questions as well uh, as touch on the life and legacy of the late Dwight Clark and what his passing means, um, not just to the NFL, but but to all of us as a whole. And, and it's kind of one of the things I kind of started off the show saying it, it, it's all of us that's got to be a part of it, and, and Dwight Clark's fight uh, is, is just proving that once again. So plenty more to come here. Uh, final segment on this Wednesday, June 6th, the day early. You're on Press Row, broadcasting as part of the Public House Media Network. This is Nicole Kelly, host of Loud and Proud here on Public House Media. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Once you're done with this episode, I hope you'll come check out my show, Loud and Proud, where we talk about issues facing the disability community. A new show comes out weekly. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you never miss an episode of Loud and Proud. Thanks again for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. This is Katie, co-host of Coffee with Keith and Katie here on Public House Media. Once you are done with this episode, I hope you'll come check out my show, Coffee with Keith and Katie, where we talk about the adventures of our daily lives and relationship. A new show comes out every Tuesday and Friday at 8.30 p.m. Central. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you never miss an episode of Coffee with Keith and Katie. Thanks again for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. Feel it coming in the air yeah. And the screams from everywhere yeah. I'm addicted to the thrill I'm ready. It's a dangerous Stop. love affair Can't be scared when it goes down Got a problem, tell me Stop. now Only thing that's on my mind Is who gonna run this town Welcome back on Press Rose. We close up shop here on this Wednesday, June 6, 2018. A day early for you. Uh, little scheduling issues here this week, but happy to be still with you on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spreaker.com, Stitcher.com, and, of course, ThePHMedia.com. Uh, you can always get in touch with the show on social media, Twitter and Instagram, at Press Row PHM. You can email the show, Press Row PHM, at gmail.com, or you can find us on Instagram, uh, excuse me, on uh, Facebook, Press Row by Public House Media. Get to some of your listener questions we do every single week. Jason in Ohio, uh, new video showing LeBron even more frustrated after the game one loss. Does this cement him leaving Cleveland? Look, I don't know what this means for him leaving Cleveland. I don't know if he ends up staying there. Um, I wouldn't be surprised one way or the other. I really wouldn't. Part of me doesn't think he needs to stay in Cleveland anymore. He won a title. What's the point in him staying? But uh, the other part is he put this team together. So the only reason to be upset is at himself. He's the only person to blame. Um, And when you look at this new video, if you haven't seen it, it's LeBron after J.R. Smith dribbles out the clock in regulation, not knowing what the score was. um, LeBron heads back over and then goes and asks if they had a timeout or not. Saying, you can see him say, did we not have any timeouts? And when Tyron Lue, you assume the head coach, uh, you assume he says, no, we had one. LeBron just basically is kind of shell-shocked, even more so. Um, it, it's really interesting uh, to see what happens. And it's just, oh my goodness. It, it's I don't know what this means. I, I In that moment, he probably regrets a lot of things. But it's unbelievable um, LeBron saying he hesitated calling a timeout when J.R. Smith was dribbling away from the basket because he wasn't sure if they had one and didn't want to get a technical foul. That's understandable. Didn't want another C- uh, Chris Webber incident happening. But at the same time, if how how did that many people not know what's going on? 
How does J.R. Smith not know that it's a tie ball game? How does LeBron not know if he has timeouts? How does the head coach, Tyron Lue, not know if he's got a timeout that he should be able to call it? Um, Tyron Lue saying that, that everybody knew it, so there was no problem with communication. Um, and it's it's just incredible. Um, it's it's insane to me to think that this could be a reason why he leaves. If he's, I'll be honest, LeBron's already made up his mind, I think. I think he's made up his mind whether or not he's leaving Cleveland. So we'll find out in the coming months. But I think I think it's, the decision's already been made. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see exactly where he goes if he leaves. But I don't think what happened in Game 1 has any bearing on it whatsoever. I just think it may have either solidified his decision or gave him something else to think about heading into this summer. Uh, Mark in Oklahoma, Kyler Murray uh, was selected ninth overall in the Major League Baseball draft by the Oakland Athletics. Uh, He was the backup to Baker Mayfield and will be uh, supposedly the starting quarterback in Oklahoma. What would you choose, the baseball career or going back to Oklahoma as the quarterback? Listen, it's really hard not to take the situation that Kyler Murray is in. Uh, ninth overall pick by the Athletics. The assigned value to the ninth pick, $4.7 million. Um, he's going to have to make a decision whether or not saying that he's planning to play football in 2018. He could play with Oakland and still play this year, or he could you know, say no um, to football and you know, join the A's organization here this summer. Um, he would still have his football scholarship, as long as he met his 12-hour academic requirement, even if he signed baseball. So he can still go to school, get his degree, um, but I, it's hard not to. When you're already being given that much kind, that much money, five-star recruit for football, um, said he wasn't worried heading into the draft. This year, he hit cleanup and played center field for the Sooners, uh, hit 296, 10 homers, 47 RBI, 10 stolen bases. <sighs> I, I'll be honest, man. I, I, I would take that. I would take that money. I'd go play professional baseball because I, I haven't seen him enough. I don't know if anybody's seen him enough to really evaluate his ability as a football player. So who knows if he's really going to be that kind of guy? Who knows if he's going to be talented enough for this team? So, um, yeah, I, I understand you're a five-star recruit, but when you're that talented... Um, last year, let's see, for Oklahoma football, 18 of 21, 359 yards, um, ran for 87 yards and three touchdowns. So who knows? Maybe, maybe he could play that well, um, in college, but it's, there's still a lot to be decided. I just think you got 4.7 million kid that's sitting right there on the table. How do you not go and take that? It's, it's kind of tough, uh, tough decision for Kyler Murray. I kind of envy him for having to make that choice, but. He could do whatever he wants, that's for sure. Uh, Let's see here. Um, Eric in Sacramento, Madison Bumgarner made his return to the mound on Tuesday night. What did you think? Um, Listen, I I drafted Madison Bumgarner in both my fantasy leagues. I don't care. I knew that he was injured. I knew he wasn't going to pitch until probably late May, early June at the best. And I didn't care because he's that talented. And last night, he goes six innings, eight hits, two runs, three strikeouts. Zero walks. I thought he looked good. Uh, 82 pitches, 58 of them for strikes. He wasn't the typical dominant bum garner. Um, you know, faced 25 batters, only struck out three. Usually you see that number around six or seven for him. But he gets 12 flyouts. He doesn't give up a home run. Scatters eight hits over six. You know, I think that's a big, big step forward for Madison bum garner and for this Giants team, too, to be able to get him back. Because you look at that NL West. That NL West is terrible right now. I mean, other than the Diamondbacks, who he was pitching against, Bumgarner, last night, um, you know, the Giants are only a game and a half out. It, it's not a great division. Diamondbacks are 31, you know, are, are uh, a couple games ahead. You got Colorado right there, just a couple games over 500. Dodgers are 500. Giants are right there. It's, it's an easy division for them to be competitive in with Madison Bumgarner. Um, so I don't know, um, 
how much of an impact he makes, but this is an offense that has come around. Andrew McCutcheon has been so much better um, than expected. Uh, Evan Longoria is starting to hit again. This is a team that is starting to look like what they actually put together. And when you add in Madison Bumgarner, um, the fact that Jeff uh, Jeff Samarja, Johnny Cueto are on the disabled list, it, it, this could not have come at a better time for the Giants and to have Bumgarner back. And if he can continue to get better, and you assume that he will, it only makes this Giants team that much more impressive, that much more scary. So, And it should be, hopefully, a lot of fun to see what happens with this Giants team because it's only June 6th, you know, and, and he's got probably another 15, 18 starts in him to see what he can do, to see how much better he can possibly be. So should be a lot of fun. Looking forward to it. Happy to have Madison Bumgarner back because he is a lot of fun to watch. This is a guy who was a World Series MVP just a couple of years ago because of how dominant he was in that postseason for, for the Giants. As always, we appreciate your guys' uh, listener questions. You can get in contact with the show all throughout the week. Doesn't matter when it is. Facebook, Press Row by Public House Media. Twitter and Instagram, at Press Row PHM. Email the show, Press Row PHM at gmail.com. You can find me on Twitter if you want, at Chris Heimel, C-H-R-I-S-H-E-I-M-A-L-L. Uh, and as always, subscribe, rate, review, share us with your friends and family. Help continue to grow this show. Make us one of the fastest-growing sports podcasts in North America. You can check us out on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, TuneIn Radio, Spreaker.com, Stitcher.com, and, of course, thephmedia.com. want to close out the show today uh, talking about, of course, um, the passing of Dwight Clark, 61 years old, on Monday um, after a lengthy battle with ALS, um, contracted it. In 2017, um, so really only about a year and three months, um, said he believes that the development of the ALS was a result of playing football, uh, suffered three concussions during his playing career, uh, and has since, uh, again, uh, passed away. But the outpouring of support for his family, the memorials that you know the Niners and the NFL community have done for this guy a two-time Super Bowl champ two-time all-pro um had his numbers retired uh inducted in, by the Niners inducted into the Clemson Hall of Fame where he went to college inducted into the Bay Area Sports Hall of Fame he is an incredible football player and has a tremendous legacy in that of course the catch that everybody remembers um against the Dallas Cowboys. But what I really kind of think of here and what I what really strikes out to me most about Dwight Clark um, and his battle with ALS was how much he really started and tried to fight this to be a advocate for ALS research. It's one of those things, this is one of the amazing parts, and it's unfortunate um, that this is what happens. But it takes a a celebrity, a larger-than-life person to a lot of us for us to become, I don't want to say aware, but active in the fight against these things. You know, Jim Kelly's a great example. Jim Kelly has been battling cancer for years, the Buffalo Bills quarterback. He's going to get the Jimmy V Award this year at the ESPYs, rightfully so. Um, but when you look at Dwight Clark, and we look at ALS, it's one of those diseases that almost never gets talked about. Um, And of course, the other, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, you had the whole ice bucket challenge, which was great. It was awesome to see that kind of stuff, but it shouldn't take those kind of things. This is what I talk about, folks, and I'm not going to try to get on a soapbox here for you because I know, um, you know, as, as much as I hate the stick to sports narrative, you, you don't come here for, for preaching, uh, you don't you don't listen to the show for that, um, but it's it's incredible to think that for as many people who retweeted um, what Kelly Clark his wife put out on social media after he passed, if a tenth of those donated to research, if you know a third of those went and volunteered to help, who knows where we would be in these battles? Who knows what would happen with these types of things? Um, I'm not trying to, you know, again, make anybody feel guilty or make myself 
holier than thou because I've, you know, as, as, as a cancer survivor, I myself have not done enough. I have not practiced what I'm preaching right now. But it's one of those things that Dwight Clark was an incredible human being um, who had an unfortunate battle with a terrible disease that we still don't know enough about. And I really just wish and hope and pray that at some point we get to that moment where it doesn't take a celebrity, a legend, an icon passing away for us to come after this thing, for us to really attack it and to make it, um, you know, irrelevant for, for lack of a better term. So Dwight Clark will be remembered for the catch. He will be remembered as a two-time champ, as one of the greatest um, at his position in that era. And his number is rightfully retired. And the Niners will rightfully honor him this year. Uh, but I just I just don't want it to be, and I hope that it's not one of those things that just kind of goes away after a couple of weeks, a couple of months. You know, we forget about it, and we forget about why he passed away. And it's because of a disease that we still don't know enough about. So um, that's just all I want to leave you guys with is, you know, there's still so much more we can do as opposed to just helping out on social media with a retweet. It's not that simple. There's so much more we should be doing and can be doing, uh, myself included. So hope you all enjoyed the show today. Appreciate you uh, bearing with us through some scheduling conflicts here this week. We'll be back next Thursday uh, on the 14th. We look forward to it. Possibly two new champions in the NBA and the NHL. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, review, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spreaker.com, and Stitcher.com. Find us on social media, Twitter and Instagram, at PressRowPHM, Facebook, Press Row by Public House Media. And until next week, I'm Christian Heimel. I'll see you on Press Row. Press Row.